thank you very much for inviting me uh, to this festival in Linz. I'd like to give you a brief in introduction into a connectome research. That's a new field of brain imaging. What is uh, the connectome? It is a network, a network like social networks. People communicate, they're doing similar things, they're exchanging and sharing information. And through the sharing of information, it becomes possible to perform complex tasks like keeping a whole society at live, uh, alive. Society lives on this interaction, as does the brain that lives uh, on the interaction of different areas. So we can't talk about activity in a single brain region, as we heard in the first presentation by Professor Dylan Haynes. Certain brain regions interact. Uh, it's the network of brain regions, the connection between Billions of neurons code whatever is happening in our human brain. They're coding the connection between pieces of information, and they code our personality. They make us individual, and they also code memory. Memory in the human brain. Uh, is saved in the connection between the neurons. Uh, through these connections, um, do I have the ability to associate and to remember things? Now, how can we, how can we study that? Uh, there are two ways. Uh, we can use MRI techniques to look into the human brain based on brain activity. We measure a brain activity in each individual image and study that. The other possibility would be to look at the structure of the brain. How do the individual regions connect to each other? And on that basis, I can develop the connectome. Um, when we look at functional activity, brain activity, as in this example, we can see that this is a dynamic uh, um, image. The brain, even if no task is being performed, this is a brain at rest, so to speak. And I can watch the slow changes going on in the brain. Uh, some regions light up and become darker again. Uh, bright colors stand for a strong activity, a lot of blood flow, a lot of oxygen consumption, neuronal activity. Blue is weak neuronal activity. Certain areas always light up together. It's not just the red point, uh, which we've just seen, but there is the yellow spot uh, um, that uh, show up together. In, uh, they synch they're synchronized. And when we look at the time sequence as a signal in this diagram, 400 seconds, that is several minutes, the brain is oscillating slowly. And I single out two red spots. And they are synchronized in their activity. So most probably, these two regions are talking to each other. They, have, they relate to each other one way or the other. As in a social network, people are doing similar things. They get up in the morning. They go somewhere. When you look at uh, what they're doing during the day, 
it's synchronized in a way, as is the case in the brain. But not all brain regions are synchronized. It's only groups that are being synchronized. So in this network, in this connectome, there are sub-networks that relate to each other more closely. So let's single out such a spot, the red uh, ball which I can move. Now, how do, how, to what an extent are other spots synchronized with that red spot? Uh, so in the posterior lobe, uh, there is a strong synchronization uh, with the front, but not with the middle part. So there are networks that communicate actively and, that, and others that are independent of each other. So when I turn this into a graph, we get f the functional connectome. Each of these end points stands for a small brain region. And if you look at the directions represented by different colors from left to right, the left hemisphere is talking to the right one that's shown in red. If it's from, uh, if it's the other way around, it's green. <coughs> These connections have endpoints, but they also vary in strength. And this network is very characteristic of uh, the human being. This is how the connections are coded uh, at the macroscopic level in the brain. Unlike neurons, where you can see the individual synapses, uh, uh, this is a much coarser level order of magnitude of millimeter or even centimeters. This network is variable. It's the network at a certain point in time. So when you assign a certain task to a human being, we did an experiment in which the test subject had to perform a certain task, a learning task. Balancing had to be learned. Once a week, they had to stand on this machine, and they had to learn which is unstable, and they had to learn to keep it stable and in balance. And we checked the connectome. Has the connectome changed over time? We found out that there are certain regions that change their connectivity. Relative to their learning performance, and it's coded at the macroscopic level in this network. Those are the first results of connectome, functional connectome research. And what we can tell already is that the brain shows synchronized activity. We don't know if there is a real connection between different brain areas. Um, it may well be that the areas, the activity of those areas is synchronized. So the task they're given may trigger these activities without these areas exchanging activities. In society, many people get up in the morning and go to work. It looks as if it were synchronized, but these people don't even know each other. They don't talk to each other. If we want to find out if these brain areas communicate with each other, like two people talking to each other, we can use another method. by analyzing connections in the brain. That's another MRI technique which we're using. We're looking not only at gray matter, 
that is the neurons, the cell bodies at the edges of the brain as shown on the right. Uh, it's a frontal section and the darker areas are those where the functional activity is taking place. When you're looking at a bicycle, uh, the gray area will be activated. But there is also uh, other cell tissue, the so-called white matter. These are the fiber ends, endings, connections from nerve cell to nerve cell, long um, axonal uh, nerve endings with a myelin sheath with a high lipid content. On the left, this is from a manual of anatomy. You can see the nerve fibers that have been prepared there. But we want to look at that in vivo. We want to observe the dynamic movements in the white fibers. But we do have a problem there because MRI only generates a gray image. All you can identify there is differences in brightness. Um, Mr. Haynes said that uh, the function can be measured uh, indirectly, so to speak, through the um, oxygen content in the blood. And uh, we are taking a similarly indirect <coughs> approach. We look at the interaction uh, between these bundles of nerve fibers with the surrounding tissue, which is not just tissue, but also water molecules. So when you look at the nerve cells there, those are nerve cells surrounded by water molecules. There are the long fiber endings, an axion, and the water molecules show a stronger diffusion along the nerve fibers than elsewhere. These bundles generate water or encourage water diffusion. Now, if we can measure the dynamic movement of the water molecules, uh, we get an impression of the microscopic structure, which is much finer than the resolution of our MRI images. Water diffusion is measured in many different directions. And on that basis, And uh, we can reconstruct this shape, uh, which represents the local water diffusion and the distribution of fibers. The cube around it is the, uh, it symbolizes our voxel. It's a rather large volume of one or two millimeters. And within that volume, we can see the movement of the water. And we reconstruct it in that shape. If we do that uh, in the form of a disk or of, of one, for one slice of the MRI image, it's much more colorful. We can see the connections from left to right in red, from back to front in green. And 
from a top to bottom in blue. When we zoom into this image, we can see that the connections intersect. They cross each other. Uh, red and blue uh, fiber bundles intersect. They penetrate each other and uh, they go in different directions. They have different orientations. Now, on the basis of this local orientation, we can calculate the fiber con con connections. We can, can't mention the axions, but a representation thereof. So step by step, the individual fiber bundles can be reconstructed. This image, which originally is nothing but gray uh, values, we can um, develop the orientation of the fiber bundles and we can calculate the network. Those are the interconnecting fibers. And when you do that for the brain as a whole, you get thousands and thousands of such lines which are beautiful to look at and also very detailed showing the basis. This is the basis for the anatomical connectome, the green uh, lines uh, from back to front, uh, the red ones from top to bottom, and the blue ones from bottom to top. Uh, it's a very dense image. You can't tell very well what's going from where to where. You can't distinguish individual orientations. You have such a, a density of connections, but you can single out individual parts on the computer, singling out a particular area, and you want to see the connections between two areas. That would be one fiber bundle, and you can tell exactly which brain areas are connected by those fiber bundles and parameters of the fiber bundle can be analyzed. We can find out additional information about the microstructure. For example, um, the myelin, the thickness of the myelin sheath, uh, the orientation of the fiber bundles. Uh, so you can obtain additional information. Once we've analyzed the individual fiber bundles, uh, we want to know which research questions can we address that way. One question we found to be of particular interest is the language network. Uh, how can the human being process language in a way that distinguishes us from other living beings? Uh, the language network is well suited for that because it uh, takes up a large part of the brain. We have different regions <coughs> in the brain responsible for the language network. The areas in red and blue are involved uh, with language. They're connected uh, by fiber bundles. We have a dorsal uh, part, uh, the arcuate physical, and uh, we also have uh, a connection between the uh, red and the blue areas. This anatomical connection is a key information, a key piece of information when it comes to understanding how language works. This is a specific example of language processing. Language consists of different components, grammar, syntax, and there are 
more complex forms of syntax and simpler ones. Simple syntax can be understood by animals. Um, monkeys can understand sequences of words, but when it comes to more complex, complex syntax, they won't be able to understand that. Now, uh, uh, convoluted sentences. Uh, uh, it, it's different brain regions that are responsible for complicated syntax or for simple syntax. Now, are there different connections? This has been investigated, and we found that there are a small shift in um, the language network, depending on whether it's simple syntax or complicated syntax. And these are different fiber bundles. Uh, the orange path is taken um, when it comes to simple syntax. Now, is the language network static or can it change? Is it variable? How does it develop? We know that children only understand simple sentences. When we look at functional activation in children and compare it with adults, we find that on the whole, activation is simple in the temporal lobe and the frontal lobe, but there are minute differences. And when we look at the different points of activation and uh, calculate the fiber connection, we find that in an adult, it's only the dorsal part, the yellow one, that is active, whereas in children, the blue part is also active. What can we conclude from that? The yellow part is not yet fully developed in children, and the children have to involve an additional part of the brain. the lines are thinner in children. And if you were to take microstructural measurements, you would find that in the dorsal part, um, children are not yet fully developed. So this is a bundle which apparently matures later than the dorsal part. So we have a dynamic development. Um, when we look at a newborn, Again, the dorsal and the ventral part in the newborn, the dorsal part, the ventral part, the, the green one, is quite similar uh, to the green part in adults, so it matures very early, whereas the dorsal part uh, is still quite weak and doesn't have the blue component yet. And when you compare that with uh, uh, primates and monkeys, uh, you will find that the dorsal part is specific to humans and most probably responsible for language. It's underdeveloped in the chimpanzee and the in the macaque. It's hardly developed, so we have a parallel uh, between phylogenesis and orthogenesis. Um, a child, as it is stimulated, uh, can develop these parts and is then later able to solve complex like linguistic tasks. So, now, I'd like to show uh, this in interactive form. We have a web platform where you can look at the fiber ban bundles interactively. And we also have an interactive 3D uh, projection. We call it fire and wire. The neurons are firing and uh, uh, establishing connections and uh, before I conclude, I'd like to show you one last video, one last slide. Very impressive images, I think. 
uh, that take us through the brain uh, from front to back. And uh, fiber connections are being built uh, in the natural colors which the brain supplies, uh, very granular, very uh, fine images. Thank you very much, and I look forward to your questions.